Hi, hello, welcome. Thank you very much for clicking on the thumbnail and checking out my video. Like several of my other recent videos, this will be a list of 20 nasty things in Fear and Hunger 2 Termina. No point in wasting time, let's get to it. Number one, the centaur. Let's start off the list with this enraging and also off-putting centaur. I'm not gonna verbally describe what type of amalgamation this monster looks like, but one look at the design, which looks like an inversed centaur, I think it's pretty evident what this monster design is alluding to. The centaur will be found on the way to Bunker 1, in the deep woods where you activate one of the three teletroscope stations. You'll be running back and forth in a lightly forested area before the entrance of the bunker. To the unprepared party, the centaur is a formidable challenge that needs to be overcome if fought. Fortunately, evasion is an option. The centaur will use a stampede attack if all four of its legs are healthy. The stampede attack deals a lot of damage and hits the entire party, being able to wipe it out in two or three attacks. Fortunately, most of your party should have enough agility to get one attack in before the centaur's stampede attack. So if the party is able to deal enough damage to one of its legs, it will stop the stampede attacks and the centaur will be forced to switch to other attacks that only hit one party member at a time. So if you are able to disable one of his legs on the first turn before he is able to do a stampede attack, your odds for surviving the encounter will increase greatly and the rest of the encounter might just be trivial from here on in. Fortunately, there's only one centaur roaming the Preheville area. If you deal with this monstrosity, you won't have to revisit him again on the same playthrough. Due to his damage output and the unnerving monster design, the centaur well deserves its place at the top of any list of nasty things. Number 2. The Bell End Encountering the Bell End means that you're entering the end game. In normal difficulty, the Bell End is only encountered after entering Mausoleum Alley, after going through the secret passage in the Church of Almer. They are a resilient threat in the last third of the game. Fortunately, they're not too hard to avoid. The Bell End's monster design is similar to the Mumbler, in terms of where it draws visual inspiration from, armed with a spear, and is able to harden itself to negate most damage. They are a real nuisance when approaching the museum or the tower. Combat against the Bell End usually devolves into a throbbing grind as the Bell End's hardened ability will negate a lot of the incoming damage. We don't get too much lore or backstory to the Bell End, but from the combat dialogue, the only thing we can derive is that they are territorial and might hesitate in attacking you if you recognize that you've trespassed onto its territory. Dan's medical ability tells us that the bell end has the sturdy shell-like exoskeleton. The skin or the surface layers feel like hardened leather that has been burned to a crisp. And for these reasons, the bell end is one of the nastier encounters you'll have in the second half of your journey in Preheville. Number three, the Ratkin Gang. A form of evolved rat found in the sewers and in greater numbers further underneath the city. Entering the foundations of the cave, you'll notice one of the ratkin further down the tunnel. If you approach it, it will run away, wait for you to approach again, and then repeat. If you follow him all the way to the end, you'll end up in this little nook of the cave system with two treasure chests. Shortly thereafter, you'll realize this is a trap, as a pack of the ratkin box you in. Some armed with weapons, some just using their natural claws, the ratkin spring a planned out ambush on you. With their numbers, weapons, ferocity, they do present a serious threat as a group. This encounter is a great opportunity to use things like gas canisters or any spells that have AOE and can hit all members of the opposing party. After a tough fight, the player will be able to loot the chest and collect any treasures from the Ratkin. Also, if you're so inclined, you can start collecting trophies here if you have the bone saw. Number four, the Heartless One. The Heartless One is an extremely challenging optional boss that can be fought for some endgame gear. Summoned from the imperfect circle using the heart-shaped lock, the Heartless One is a new god that we learn about in Fear and Hunger 2 Termina for the first time. To summon the Heartless One, 
the player will have to enter the Church of Ulmer through the Foundations of Decay. Crashing the chandelier down will prevent the player from getting the rustic key, which is needed to encounter the Heartless One. Taking the key to Rare's Otherworld, near where we encountered its Morphia in the church, we will find someone completely covered in chains, almost as if this person was locked up and chained for a good reason. No one ends up in this position accidentally. Somebody's trying to keep the Heartless One contained and trapped. Nevertheless, we can use the Rusty Key to free the Goddess. Doing so will allow her to be summoned from an imperfect ritual circle. Once summoned, she challenges the player to a one-on-one -on -one duel that they cannot turn down. The Heartless One will appear as a woman with white hair and an imposing appearance and presentation, kind of resembling some of the character arts from Signalis. In one hand, holding the Red Virtue, an extremely light sword that allows the user attack much quicker, and she is holding a large spear in the other hand. It is said that the Red Virtue is one of the two swords forged for the ancient king of Mahabre. The duel with the Heartless One is a brutal and unrelenting battle, to the point that it is difficult to even survive her opening attack. Overcoming the Heartless One will require specific accessories and skills to be able to mitigate and counter her attacks, along with the best gear in the game. She is a brutal and overwhelming opponent. It's not hard to see why somebody felt the need to keep her contained. According to the wiki, the name and design of the Heartless One are a homage to a Fear and Hunger 2 content creator, community member, Heartless Angel Ketsueki. Something that Dark Souls taught me is that Sometimes a story is best enjoyed when you figure it out yourself. I think our brains tend to have a deeper understanding of an idea, story, or concept if we are able to understand it in pieces and then put it together as a whole rather than just getting an overview. Good environmental storytelling allows you to take pieces of a story that you've picked up through exploration and then put it all together in your head. When I was doing an Olivia run, for this video. I ran through the sewers that I had run through so many times before, probably dozens of times by now, when something stood out to me I had never noticed before. Past the water treatment puzzle, approaching the Preheville Bop and the West Preheville sewer holes, you might have noticed this area where there is a large concentration of ghouls, but unlike the ghouls on the surface, these are just sitting, resting, and holding blankets around their shoulders rather than their surface counterparts that are actively walking around and patrolling an area, like in the slums. So my question is why? Why are these ghouls seemingly resting while the ones topside were active and prowling? Also, unlike other ghouls that tend to be solitary, these ghouls are sitting in a group. So here's my current theory, and let me know what you think in the comments. I could be way off here. Could this have been a group of survivors that were seeking shelter? that fell to the effects of moon scorching? From playing masochism mode, and from what the moon scorched villagers tell us, we know that moon scorching requires direct exposure to rare's light. But is it possible the green hue could have the same effect? Could people have been exposed to moon scorching, and while still having some of their faculties and logic, made their way down to the sewers seeking safety and shelter? Maybe they were a group that were exposed to the green hue, or maybe contaminated water? It makes sense to me that given the invasion by the Bremen army and then the chaos of the festival, that some people would have sought to escape by going underground. I don't know, but when observing the ghouls grouped up in the sewers, holding blankets around themselves, almost comforting themselves, it's hard not to remember they were just villagers at some point whose lives were destroyed due to the whims of the gods. It's hard not to stare at them for a second and feel some sympathy for them. I mean, We've all had moments when we do the same, wrap something cozy around ourselves and just take a moment and a breather, collect yourself, especially in such a chaotic and turbulent world. Well, having said that, it's time to break out the bone saw and start harvesting some trophies. These heads aren't going to get to the tainted one by themselves and nobody wants to let soul stones go to waste. Number six, the white mode apartment serial killer. When I say that something in a game is inspired or similar to something in an older game, my goal is not to discredit anything. So by mentioning that something in Fear and Hunger is inspired by Silent Hill, I'm not trying to cheapen the work Orange has done. 
but rather point out that these are easter eggs for players that may have grown up playing the same games that Miro did, such as Silent Hill. If I made a game, it'd be filled with references and homages, in much the same way. So continuing Fear and Hunger's tradition of honoring older games that have laid out the foundation, upon which newer games will continue from, for number 6 we have another Silent Hill reference in Fear and Hunger, and that is the White Mode Apartment Serial Killer. Exploring Central Preheville, the player will eventually encounter the goddamn Fecal Dogs, I hate them in particular, and entered this non-assuming apartment building, only to find out that the door has locked behind you. The apartment building is large, quiet, and still. You get a chance to explore the basement, where parts and supplies are kept, and then each individual apartment, each having its own distinct theme or personality the boxed up room of a new tenant, the instruments of a music loving lady, the tenant with a puppet collection that's not creepy at all, and the one that apparently loved astronomy and telescopes, or was simply a creeper. We eventually learned the story of the serial killer in the building that had targeted the inhabitants for an ancient forbidden ritual that he would carry out, but he needed sacrifices. The story of the White Mode Apartment serial killer has a few similarities to the story of Walter Sullivan in Silent Hill 4. In Silent Hill 4, Walter tries to complete an ancient and forbidden ritual that requires human sacrifices. So he starts hunting down the inhabitants of the apartment building and sacrificing them for a ritual called the 21 Sacraments. The protagonist of Silent Hill 4, much like the party in the White Mode Apartments, eventually learns that he is trapped in the apartment building and can't get out. Just like how the doors lock behind you when you enter the apartment building in Gunger Funger 2 Termina. I just thought that was really cool. I'm a big fan of the good Silent Hill games. Moving on, number 7, The Foundations of Decay. One of the areas that most fascinates me in Preheville is, R is The Foundations of Decay. Found after solving the water treatment puzzle, the Foundations of Decay are somewhere underneath the old train station in Preheville. This mysterious location gives us more questions than answers as we explore it. Upon first descending, what stands out most is the blue hue of the caves, along with the expansive herb and mushroom variety growing down here. Like I hinted before, this also seems to partially be the realm of the Ratkin. Exploring further, we find these pile of corpses that seem to be organized into a pile around some sort of monument or, or statue. No idea what the purpose is of this or how these bodies got here. Was this grisly display here before the festival or a more recent addition? Also, if you have any information on what the structure might be, let me know in the comments. I'm kind of curious. Down here, we also encounter an old friend. This is where Moonless lives now. I wonder if her presence here means that Preheville was built on top of the cave system that the Dungeon of Fear and Hunger tapped into. Past where we encounter Moonless, we'll find a crypt filled with skulls, and it reminds me a lot of some of the themes and visual design of Blasphemous, which I had the pleasure of playing through recently, specifically Melchiades and the Ossuary, where the bones are collected. At the far end of the tunnel system, we'll find an elevator leading back up to the surface near the slums, but also connecting to the Church of Almer. Presumably, it was used by the Dark Priest to move around, access the slums, and the people that live there. Eidos is one of the most iconic enemies in Fear and Hunger 2 Termina. Most players will run into him for the first time in the nearest bunker to the train, where Nidos makes one hell of a first impression by decapitating Tanaka and stealing his hat. As long as the player hasn't defeated him in battle, Nidos will stalk the player throughout Preheville with his evil laughter echoing down the empty cobblestone streets of Preheville, all the while grinning and looking like he's having a fun time behind his twisted white and blue clown grin. In combat, he proves to be a challenge to all but a well-equipped party. He has high HP and is able to inflict a good bit of damage with his needle whip and poison the player with the syringe he's holding in his other hand. If his arms are damaged enough, he'll stop with the pleasantries and whip out a pistol that he'll use for the rest of the fight. That I know of, other than the weeping scope, he is the only monster encountered in Preheville that uses a firearm. Well, I guess you could include the platoon in that, um, depending on what you would call a firearm. In the lore, 
It suggested that Needles is or has some connection to Baron Einher von Dutch from Dan's backstory. Before being drafted into the war, Dan was studying medicine under the Baron and was engaged to his daughter Elise. When the Great War broke out, Dan was drafted to the army to serve on the front lines. While he was gone, the Baron's interest in the occult deepened. Once released from his military service with the army, he returned home to find the most tragic scene that had played out. His beloved Elise and her father Baron Einher von Dutch had perished in the middle of a ritual to an old god. While playing as Dan, he'll mention that Needles looks like his father-in-law if you inspect the body with the medical diagnosis skill, and Needles will scowl at Dan in combat. Though there's another member of the von Dutch family that is believed to be alive in some form in Perhevo. Also, Needles has a hat. Number 9. Stitches Most players will make it to the Teletroscope Station in the Deep Forest last, right when they are starting to unravel the mystery of what is really under Preheville. Here, they will run into Stitches, a character similar in theme to Needles. Stitches has a similar scarred and pale appearance to Needles. She is found underground, surrounded by monstrosities that it's believed she created. The lump of flesh, the human caterpillar, and a sew job found next to a bone saw and dismembered limbs. Inspecting her body with Dan's medical skill gives us this sad realization. She eerily reminds you of somebody. The more you entertain the idea, the more certain you become of this haunting realization. No matter how disfigured her face would be, you would always recognize your wife Elise. This woman has her appearance. You are 100% certain of it now. But it's impossible she's dead this place has gotten the best of you or maybe there is some other sinister reasoning behind all this you hope that it is only your mind that is crumbling here you wish elise has her rest now we don't know for sure what dark power reanimated elise and her father but let's hope they find their rest and that dan can find some peace after the events of the festival of termina number 10 Cutting off heads to get skills. An interesting sleight of hand that Fear and Hunger 2 does is regarding skill and progression. The game doesn't have a traditional level nor experience system, so at a glance, it appears that progression is done through gear, kind of like in the Monster Hunter games. But as you get familiar with the game, and as veterans will quickly figure out, you'll notice the presence of Soul Stones and the Hexen Tables. Getting even more familiar with the world of Termina, you'll learn that soul stones can be crafted by presenting offerings to the Tainted One. Offerings being heads that you've cut off with the bone saw. This is a very interesting mechanic in the game. Since there is a much expanded skill system, there is a strong incentive to make sure you have enough soul stones to get everything you need for the end game. But what do you do if you don't have enough soul stones that you found through exploration? Herein lies the trick. The motivation to collect heads will change how you view Preheville and the game. All of a sudden, the moon scorched villagers in the, in the slums, the group of ghouls in the sewers, the bodies in East Preheville, the ratkin in the foundations of decay, all have a new shine, a new glamour. Leaving the bodies there, it's just so stones going to waste. So the game presents you with a moral question. Are you willing to go around the city collecting heads for more skills and power? Be careful when you stare into the abyss, for the abyss will stare back. You can have a character that one day prior was a regular civilian with no predisposition to violence, and then the next day, a jaded head collector with a bag full of trophies to offer up to the tainted one for more power. Also, another fun note on how fear and hunger pushes you to do things you wouldn't do in other games. If a party member dies in combat, you don't get the soul nor can you collect the head to trade with Pocket Cat. So if you want to get someone's skills, the game makes you be the aggressor. The game wants you to get your hands dirty if you want it to be easier. Now, you don't have to, but the game would be easier if you turn on the other participants and then just became a butcher that roamed the city of Preheville collecting heads. I thought it was clever and insidious how Fear and Hunger 2 will incentivize you to do things you wouldn't have thought to do in a game, and how the game forces you to do nasty stuff to make the game easier.
All right, and moving on to number 11, continuing a similar theme, we have getting access to the tower. If you're going for ending A, you can beat the game without ever using violence against any other participants of the festival. But that changes if you're going for ending B. So say you start a new game and you already know what skills you want for that given run. You can then proceed to hunt down every other par participant like a cold-blooded killer at the very start of the game. I think it's a very interesting and powerful narrative tool to immerse the player in the dark world of the festival. And this is something I really thought was interesting for ending B, where you confront Rare in the tower. The easiest way to get end game gear is to have a party to make the early and mid game easier. Meaning that if you're going to try to fight Rare, you might squad up in the first parts of the game. But that means approaching the end game, you'll have to kill everybody else in your party. Or find a way for them to accidentally meet their end, such as unequipping all their armor and forgetting to heal them. But even after dealing with the deaths of everybody in your party, you will inevitably hunt down the other participants. So if you're trying to save yourself, you will eventually end up with a lot of blood on your hands. And this stands in stark contrast to ending A, where your character sacrifices themselves entering the white bunker and not surviving the events of the game but all the remaining characters will survive. So it's an interesting contrast between both endings. In one ending, you doom everybody else but save yourself while having tons of blood on your hands. And the other, where you fight the machine god, where you try to do the right thing, sacrificing yourself so that others may live. I'm sure there's some deep moral or philosophical statement here, but I don't know what it is. It just stood out to me that there's such a difference thematically between both endings. Do you survive at the, at the cost of the lives of everybody else? Or do you become the sacrificial hero and go into the white bunker so that the others might escape Preheto? Number 12, accessibility and disability. Something I've mentioned before that I liked about Fear and Hunger is in its portrayal of character types that don't always get represented in different forms of media a child soldier, an addict, a trans woman, and to a lesser degree, some of the other characters, which include a mystic from a foreign land, a doctor, an engineer, and a disabled botanist. Games, movies, books can be great vehicles to create empathy or to present a different life experience to the viewer or the player by giving you an inside view to the life experience of a different person. Something that gave me an experience like that was playing as the botanist, Olivia. She was one of the later characters I played as, meaning that my first runs through Preheville were all with able-bodied characters. During these first run-throughs, at no point did I ever ask myself, how would Olivia, who is bound to a wheelchair, navigate this terrain and urban landscape? It hadn't impacted me, so I didn't think about it, as tends to happen. The first time I played with Olivia, I got a glimpse of what a disability such as hers would be like. Small things that I didn't even consider became big obstacles when playing as Olivia. Routine actions now involved conscious effort and planning. Now you have to be sure to hit C to be able to climb up the stairs or face being stuck. Do I give my best weapon to Olivia since she can be tackled and knocked out for a round or do I give it to a different character that doesn't have that vulnerability? Playing as Olivia, I realized just how many staircases there are in this urban environment, how nothing here was built with her disabilities in mind, which kind of makes sense historically given the setting. If you can't climb stairs, well, sorry for you, which sucks because outside of the slums, I think most of the apartments and dwellings are not at surface level. In different ways, we will all have challenges or disabilities, shortcomings, handicaps that others don't. Mountains or stairways that we have to overcome that others may not see. The same way that I never registered most of the stairs in the game until I had to dismount from the wheelchair to navigate them. When I was younger, I had a really bad stutter. That put me in a situation where I knew what I wanted to say, but was unable to do so, which sometimes caused people to laugh. I used to wonder why did I have to deal with this when no one else around me did. So I just wanted to take this moment and reflect on how cool it is that Fear and Hunger 2 attempts to give you a little bit of a perspective 
under trials and tribulations some other people around us might go through that we don't see by including a character that faces mobility challenges. And like I said, we all have our challenges. They may not be the same or even comparable, but a mountain is always a challenge to the person that has to climb it. And we could all learn to have more empathy and consideration as we navigate the landscapes that we find ourselves in. This adult shit ain't easy. So just remember you're not alone if you feel tired or exasperated, just trying to make the day today. I don't know if that helps, but I hope it does. So yeah, next on our list. Number 13, being moon scorched. Being moon scorched means being exposed to the cold green radiation of rare, which perverts and twists any human life exposed to it. Rare's green cold radiation stands in contrast to the sun's yellow heat. For radiation to be cold doesn't even make sense in physics. It would mean that this is a form of electromagnetic radiation that extracts energy or heat from whatever it comes in contact with. I think this only amplifies the corrupting and otherworldly effect of the trickster moon rare. In normal difficulties, we will only see the effects of moon scorching after the fact. To see the effects of moon scorching, the player will have to do one of two things. Wait until the third night of the festival, which can be accomplished by taking the slacker route to the festival and just sleeping through the entire thing. Or by exposing yourself directly to the effects of moon scorching in masochism mode, where you can only withstand a limited time of exposure to the moon before being corrupted and transforming into your moon scorched form. And if you want to see what the character's moon scorched form is, you can check out my other video on the city of fear and hunger. Number 14, pocket cat's room. If the player is able to get affinity to rare increased three times, the golden gate skill is unlocked. The golden gates are another form of fast travel connecting the otherworldly locations found throughout the journey. But in this mysterious golden hallway, there are deeper mysteries still. If the player investigates the pitch black walls, they will find that one section of the wall opens into another room. Inside this room, the player will encounter the mysterious stranger who doesn't communicate much and is chewing something. His face appears bandaged and his head deformed. Passing up the stranger, we can enter another room. This is Pocket Cat's secret room. Examining the items here, we will see a collection of toys, including the peculiar doll the little girl had, a jack-in-the-box that seems to reference Perkele, a tin man, and a baby blight doll. But something disturbing lays behind the toys. Here, we can see where Pocket Cat would bring the poor little victims of his hunting. Bags leaking of blood can be seen alongside the toys. We don't have a way to be sure what's inside of them, but circumstantial evidence is enough. The Decrepit Priest. Something I noticed when I was replaying through Fear and Hunger Termina recently is how loathsome the Decrepit Priest really are. I've already gone over the orphanage and everything that happened there. So instead, I'd, I'd like to focus on the other nasty characteristics of these priests. That creepy smile of theirs. The Decrepit Priest have easily the most punchable smile in all of Perheville. No, no, all of Bohemia if not the most punchable faces in all of Eastern Europa, I dare say. It's almost as if their evilness and the essence of Grogoroth had infected and permeated their smile to make it as unsettling as possible. And their creepy smile is in addition to their Hellraiser-like crisscross skin, which just gives me goosebumps thinking about. And if all that wasn't bad enough, take a look at the decrepit priest after death animation which triggered for me when I failed a coin toss and was done in by the choke attack. A scene where the player is ritually sacrificed plays out, with seemingly deranged and bloodthirsty villagers dancing around the crucifixion, which removed any doubt about the dark arts still being practiced by the priest at the Church of Almer. For being able to creep out and make a fear hunger veteran think, why am I playing this game? I think the decrepit priests deserve a place on this list. The Crow Chimera? in the white bunker. Similarly to some of Stitch's experiments and handiwork that we saw in Bunker 1, in the white bunker we see the human crow chimera. We don't know much about it, maybe it's a throwback to the crow mauler that I know of. There's nothing in the lore, notes, books, or dialogues that would give us insight into its history or, or purpose. Maybe the memory of what became of Captain Rudimer survived through the ages perhaps in some book or through Legard's memory. 
Is it possible that somebody in the Bremen army, under the command and direction of Lagarde, was trying to replicate or revive the Crow Mahler? The site of the White Bunker might be pretty close to where the original dungeon of Fear and Hunger was. Could they have found what remained of the body of Captain Rudimer, maybe as a plan B to use against the old gods, or maybe as a bodyguard and protector for Rayla to keep those pesky intruders out? Either way, it will remain a mystery for now, and the Crow Chimera will remain the office mascot of the White Bunker. The Commander and Platoon In the bottom of the White Bunker, having crossed both of the impressive and colossal chasms, we reach the bottom. Here begins the final three-boss gauntlet you'll have to endure and overcome in order to get ending A, and the Red Arc skill that's become one of my favorites. The first boss in this gauntlet is the duel of the commander, also known as the Soviet Trooper and Platoon. We first catch sight of them when we see the leather-clad commander. You can tell she honestly enjoys her job. Nobody dresses in leather like that, unless they like it. You could say that she's very obvious about her devotion to Sylvian. Approaching her, she merrily skitters away. A moment later, something large can be first felt and then heard approaching the darkness. Then we see the platoon, similar in design to the human hydra. We can assume that the platoon is the result of a massive Sylvian ritual where dozens, if not hundreds, were fused together. The resulting human hydra was then armed with new military technology to give it some extra punch. The resulting human tank was then placed under the order and control of a fanatical Bremen officer, the commander. The devoted, leather-clad believer in the Kaiser enjoys the thrill of battle. If you tell her the war is over, you learn that this isn't just a duty to her, but a labor of love. Engaging them in combat, the biggest threat will be the cannon on the platoon, which can one-shot anybody in your party. Fortunately, the commander and platoon function as a duel, operating in unison. Therefore, removing the weakest link cripples their combat capabilities. Taking out the commander will mean removing the cannon on the platoon from the equation, since the platoon will only fire when ordered by the commander. With the commander out of the picture, the party will have to withstand the platoon's much easier to manage melee attacks. Whittling away at the platoon, it can be put down easily enough, searching the body of the commander after the fight. You get the important little detail that the Sylvian trooper doesn't exactly have any crevices where to hide anything. I can't imagine that outfit is comfortable. With the Kaiser's bodyguards out of the picture, the party may then continue to the second of three threats. Moving on, the rematch with the King in Yellow. A throwback to one of the endings of the first game, we have the encounter with the Kaiser of the Bremen army himself, the leader of a fierce military that led the invasion of Preheville and triggered the start of the Great War that burned across Europa. The ascended new god, Lagarde, captain of the Knights of the Midnight Sun, Meeting this bastard baby is far more entertaining if you have Nasra in your possession, as they will revisit their old debate from part 1. Here, we hear about Legard's machinations to turn a repeating cycle into a spiral that one day would push humanity further and further from the grasp of the old gods and the old world. Legard hopes to build a new world out of the control of the primordial forces of reality through having humanity merge with the machine god. Lagarde has found a way to create a universal concept that can be shared by all mankind, which would result in the birth of a new god. The fight with Lagarde rings with echoes of part one. Again, he is accompanied by an asterisk and a snake, which will cast healing whispers on the king in yellow. Lagarde can also use his leg sweep ability from when he was in the dungeon in the Kingdom of Rondon. After defeating the King in Yellow, Nazra seems frustrated, as if Legard's plans would succeed regardless. He then says to go smash the Machine God at least, to try to piss on his plans. Number 19, the Machine God. The party enters the White Womb of Logic, the room where awakening a god and fusing it with Rayla should have given rise to a science-driven god that could wrestle control of reality away from the old primordial gods. The Machine God, or the Logic, represents Legard's plan 
to try to create a new virtual reality built on science and engineering. A red crystallid stands on top of a spiked engine with attached exhaust ports. The machine god stands imposingly and towering over the party. A new concept of what humanity could become once we fuse with our machines and devices, enveloping humanity with data and algorithms, boosting engagement in this new virtual world where all data and all connections are instantaneous. The music is ominous and threatening, sometimes playing the old melody of Mahabra, the only other location that we know of that has seen the ascension of humans to godhood. After some time, the machine god will evolve into what would be its final form. We see the body of Rayla fully integrated into the logic with no clear division of where machine starts and humanity ends. A portrait of a future for humanity with no chaos and only machine maintained order, one hand representing creation and one hand representing destruction, artificial replacements for the primordial forces that have ruled over humanity since the beginning of time. At the end of the encounter, the logic will open itself up, revealing a green hue, absorbing the party into itself, bringing the reality into its new artificial reality, a new fake truth where all of humanity is restrained but connected, surrounded by an artificial green hue. And last on our list for today, Abella's weapons. As I'm sure you've seen throughout this video and in my previous video on nasty things in Termina, you might have noticed I started using a lot of Abella's crafted weapons. They are powerful and some accessible from the early game. They have high damage output and will also inflict status effects such as bleed, poison, and fire. But king among the weapons that Abella can craft is the meat grinder, a modified buzzsaw customized to make it portable and easy to wield. It has high damage output, can inflict bleed, and hits three times per turn. So if your ability is above 15, that means six attacks per turn. The challenge though is getting the meat grinder. First, you'll need the weapons craft skill, which Abella can start with. Most of the components are pretty easy to find. The challenge will be getting the bench grinder. There are only three available in the game. One in the bunker in the deep woods, one can be found after defeating the mob, and one can be stolen from Abella in combat. If the player can get one or two meat grinders and couple them with the small thing's amulet, the party will be nearly unstoppable and will be able to take out most monsters in a turn or two. After dying so many times to the horrors in Preheville, it's fun to turn the odds on them. It also, it makes exploration a lot easier, since now you can break down nearly all the doors in the game. And with that, we've reached the end of today's video. I'd like to sincerely thank you for watching. Take care of yourself and be as well as you can be. Later.